So, just to get started here, when you came in and signed in, hopefully, you picked up three handouts. One should be the history of Israel and early Christianity. One should be establishing the canon of sacred scripture. And one should be like a little Bible outline. It's a little Xerox from a book. The canon of scripture. Okay, so those are over there. There should be plenty for everyone. So, last week we had our first class, right? Right. So, we talked about God and us. So we have God. And we went through the definition of God as far as being all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, eternal, infinite, perfect, spiritual, and so on. And then also that God is truth, beauty, love, goodness. So, if God is all of this, how can poor little human beings who are so unlike God know God? So we start off with the arguments from reason. That's important because many people today say, well, how do you know there's really a God? Well, we want to be reasonable. So faith and reason do not contradict. That's always an important principle. They do not contradict. But reason is something that we use as human beings, and it only goes so far. So using reason, we can posit that there is a God. So we went through the arguments of history, the ideal meaning like principles of justice or principles of beauty. Where do those rest? In the wisdom of God. The idea of first cause. There had to be something that started everything. That there is a design, some divine wisdom, put this structure and order together. That there is the argument of amusement. That if we really open up our hearts and ponder, we will be brought into union with a God. We have to say there is a God. So arguments from reason, they're all good arguments. And we have to remember, too, that even some of the greatest scientists believed in God. Einstein, Warner von Braun, and so on. And we'll talk more about them when we get to creation. So it is perfectly reasonable to believe in God. Now, just as an aside, remember those atheist people that say there is no God. Well, prove it. They can't, right? And they spend a lot of time trying to prove that God doesn't exist. Isn't that funny? And it's almost a contradiction. If God doesn't exist, why are they proving God doesn't exist? See? What's the concern? But so they must know there really is a God. But anyway, arguments from reason. But we aren't satisfied with that because reason is reason. And only goes so far. We want a God with whom we can have a personal relationship. And that's where faith comes in and revelation. So God so loves us. God is love. God so loves us that he chose to reveal himself. And we do believe that God does send that little spark of grace into our hearts to open them. So that if we really are honest and innocent like a little child would be, that by this grace, we open up ourselves to that revelation and we say, I believe. That is faith. But faith isn't simply intellectual. Faith is living. Faith is falling in love with God. That's what faith is really about. Faith is living with God. Faith is living in the presence of God. And that's a journey, without question. But nevertheless, we respond in faith. But still there seems to be a gap here, because you still have God making himself known, mankind responding in faith. So you think of how Moses witnessed that burning bush, and there's the voice of God that speaks, but he didn't see God. Even on Mount Sinai, he didn't see God. So how do we get the perfect communication? Well, it would take everything of God, but it would take everything of mankind. And that's the beauty of Jesus Christ. True God who became true man, our Lord and Savior. And then Jesus went back to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit. There's the founding of the church. And this revelation continues on through sacred scripture and sacred tradition. That's where we left off last week. 
And now what we need to do is start filling in. And what we're going to talk about tonight is the body of revelation, what we call the deposit of faith. So sacred scripture, sacred tradition. Probably won't get through everything tonight, but we'll do the best that we can. So get to flip the board. Now, the Bible. So our primary source of revelation is the Bible. So the word Bible. <laughs> this is when you wish you had the lightning machine. <laughs> so anyway, Bible comes from the Greek biblos, the book. Okay. Now when we look at this Bible, so hopefully you all have a Bible, if not invest in one, that some people think that God sent this UPS to somebody. You know, that it all came together and so on. The Bible is a very complicated piece of literature. Now, first of all, it is that complicated piece of literature, but also we have to remember the Bible, as we say at Mass, is the Word of God. Here we have the Word of God. So God's revelation to us. But how does it come about? To appreciate the Bible, you really have to understand a little bit just about the history in which it was written. So if you go to your first handout, which would be the history of Israel and early Christianity, it helps us understand in a timeline how this Bible was written. It also then generates or sparks questions that have to be resolved. So we do know, archaeological fact, about 1850 B.C., Abraham lived. That's important. Now, prior to that, we don't have historical records. So like Noah and those stories and so on. But about 1,850 years, there is Abraham. And God made that covenant with Abraham. And then the stories go on about how the Jewish people eventually went to Egypt. They were made slaves. And then 1250 B.C., Moses is sent to rescue the Jewish people. And there is the Exodus event. When they settle in the promised land, and now they become a stable people, that the first books are written. So those first five books appear. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What the Jewish people call the Torah, the law. Moses is the author of those books. Now, when we use the term author, sometimes that means that Moses dictated that to his students, or what Moses taught, his students wrote down. But nevertheless, traditionally, the authorship is given to Moses. Granted, you may have different students writing things down, and that's why you'll have difference as far as style goes as you look at these five books. But nevertheless, the authorship is attributed traditionally to Moses. Now, those are the first five books, the Torah. 1000 BC, we have King David. So King Saul was the first king, but King David is the one who really made Israel a great country. So during this time you now start having the writings of like first and second Samuel, you're going to start having first and second Kings, so really historical books. So these books beginning with first and second Samuel will really just chronologically relate the events of the history of Israel. In 961-922 we have King David's son Solomon Usually attributed to him are a good bit of, the, well, it's the Songs of Solomon or the Book of Songs. It's also, I should have mentioned, King David and Solomon are attributed with the Psalms. And then also perhaps Solomon had the Book of Proverbs. So these would have been written. 922, there's a split. So the kingdom 
of Israel actually splits into a northern kingdom called Israel. And then there's the southern kingdom called Judah. Judah is a territory that was named after one of the sons of Jacob. So the rest of the territory is simply called Israel. Now it's about this time that you're now going to start having first and second kings being written. In 724, Assyria attacks. The northern kingdom is conquered. Southern kingdom becomes a vassal state. The book of Tobit, but also is written, but also the prophets Micah, Amos, Hosea are prophesying at this time. Okay. Now, Isaiah is also prophesying, and Isaiah is a complicated book because it's possible there were like two eras of Isaiah's, e -R -A -S, eras of Isaiah the prophet, what is called Isaiah and then Deutero-Isaiah and so on. But that's more complicated than we need to get into. 610, Babylonians conquer the Assyrians. Northern kingdom becomes a vassal state. Here you'll have Zephaniah, again Isaiah, Jeremiah prophesying. That prophecy is written down. The book of Nahum, Judith, is also written. 601, Babylonians take control of Judah. Southern kingdom becomes a vassal, and southern kingdom is conquered. Habakkuk, the prophet, is at this time Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Baruch. Jeremiah also writes Lamentations. The holy city of Jerusalem has been decimated by the Babylonians. The temple has been sacked. And so Lamentations is written, which is really a mourning over what has happened to Israel. 587, just mentioned that, the Babylonians destroyed the temple. 535, the Persians come in. And King Cyrus conquers. He allows the temple to be rebuilt. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther prophesy or live at this time. Haggai, Zechariah, also Malachi, Obadiah, Joel, we're also prophesying. Year 333, Alexander the Great of Greece conquers the territory. And it's at this point that what is called the wisdom literature is written. Now, up until this time, the Old Testament books were written in Hebrew Aramaic. At this time, since Greek becomes the cultured language, the wisdom literature books will be written in Greek. So like the book of 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Wisdom, Sirach, Ecclesiastes, all in Greek. Okay. And these books, they're called wisdom literature because they deal with questions of life. Now 1st and 2nd Maccabees is a history set of books, but then like the book of wisdom deals with the purification of the soul after death, or what happens when we die. Uh, the book of Sirach talks about husbands, wives, being parents, being a physician, being a good friend. So deeper questions of life are in those books. Probably the Old Testament literature is complete about the year 150 BC. So what do we have going on here? So if you look at a timeline, so let's pretend at some point here we have creation, right? So at the very beginning, well, about 1850 again, we have good old Abraham. Then 1250, we have Moses. And then we continue on to about 150. And here, during this period, we have the Old Testament writings. And what we look at, what we have in the Old Testament would be 46 books. Now, one thing I want you to think about here. First of all, how do the stories of like Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, 
the sons of Jacob and all that, get handed on orally. So there is this period then of an oral teaching. That these stories for 600 years are handed on and now when Moses settles the people in the promised land, they're written down. We would say, guided by the Holy Spirit, they're written. So that first books, the Pentateuch, the Torah, those five books are written, and then the other books will follow. But this period of oral teaching, this is where we get the notion of tradition. So remember, we have the Bible as the primary source of revelation, but also there is what is called, put a little arrow thing there, sacred tradition. And tradition comes from the Latin traditio, is the handing on of the faith. So how is the faith lived and taught? So that's really what's going on here. And the truth is preserved by the Holy Spirit. It's handed on, and now it's being written, and the Old Testament is complete by 150. The other thing to remember is this, that over the course of centuries, what changes? Language, how we understand things. Like when I was a kid in the late 1960s, one of the expressions was groovy. Do we use groovy much these days? No, we don't. But I'm sure there's some literature around that has groovy in it. So someone today is going to have to look up what does groovy mean. It means more than a rut in the road or something. A groove that sense, right? Groovy. So, or maybe some year someone's going to have to look up what is awesome or cool in popular language. So it's a problem of language when you think about it. Also remember, we're going from Aramaic Hebrew to Greek. There's a difference there. So the Old Testament is very complicated. We're looking at a course of 1,100 years of writing, and each of these authors is going to use their phrasing, their expressions in writing. Moreover, there is the technical terms of the language. And in the year 150, about all of these books, too, are going to be translated into Greek. So when you go from Hebrew into Greek, that's not always easy. How do you capture expressions? Just like in English, we use the word love. Well, if you went to Greek, you'd have three words for love. So love, like for God, is agape love. Love for a friend is philia love. That emotional, passionate love is eros, from which we get erotic. So you have agape, philia, eros. But in English, we have one word, love. I love a spouse. I love a parent. I love God. I love pizza. I love Fluffy the cat. But different kinds of love, right? But in Greek, you'd have three different words for that. And even same thing in some other languages. Like I know Italian has different words to express love. The love used for a husband and wife is different from like a friendship love. So, problem with language. So what I want you to see is that this gets complicated. Very complicated. Now, time goes on. So if we keep going then, 48 BC, the Romans take control. And Julius Caesar gives power to wicked King Herod. Remember, wicked King Herod is the one who will eventually order the slaughter of the innocents when Jesus is born. Now, we get to 1 AD. So 1 AD, and AD, remember, means Anno Domini in the year of the Lord. Some of the newfangled, politically correct, secular, atheistic kinds will use like CE, Common Era, or BCE, Before the Common Era. Please makes me itch. It is B.C. before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of the Lord. So, now, one thing is problem. As you see on your sheet, there's a dating problem. If you look at some books today, you'll see that Jesus was born in the year 4 B.C. And I always laugh. 
Because if B.C. is before Christ, how could Jesus be born in 4 B.C.? It's before Christ, right? But some of these archaeologists think that this little guy in the year 525 named Dionysius Exiguus, which means Dennis the Little, uh, it does. A Scythian monk of a Roman monastery changed the dating system. So it used to be that the date started with the founding of Rome and moved forward. Well, with Christianity now legalized, we thought, well, let's change everything to the birth date of Christ. So they did. But apparently this guy blew it by four years. Who knows? All I know is, as far as I'm concerned, in the year 1 AD, our dear Lord was born. And when I get to heaven, he can tell me exactly, chronologically, what happened. But we have to think, then, that in the year 30 is when Jesus started his public ministry. And that lasted for three years, according to the Gospels. So during this time of the public ministry, what's going on? Oral teaching. Jesus is instructing the apostles and others, but it's oral. So here again is the idea of the sacred tradition. Jesus dies in the year 33, and then about the year 50, we have St. Paul beginning his preaching. And St. Paul does mention the writings. He does mention the Gospels. And this is where it gets very confusing. Now, the dates that you have here are probably what you would find in a present-day book. So if you looked at a book about the New Testament or sacred scripture, this is the, the modern-day dating. So probably between 50 and by the year 100, you have then the New Testament writings. So they believe that the Gospel of St. Matthew, in its simplest form, in the Hebrew form, was written first. That's why it's first in the New Testament. And then you have St. Mark's Gospel. But then St. Matthew must have been revised into Greek. This is the scholarship speaking here. And then you have Luke coming afterwards, and then John would be the last. And then you have the book of Revelation being the final book about the year 100, written by St. John. Now, some people might think, well, if St. John was an apostle back here, he must have lived an awfully old age. He did. And remember, St. John probably was a teenager. And St. John, maybe 18 years old when Jesus died. Well, we do know St. John lived to be about 90 years old. So it does make sense. So we have that. But the New Testament writings occur here. Now, while I give you the dates here, there's one important date to remember. And that's in the year 70. You have the destruction of Jerusalem. The Jews decided to revolt against Rome. And that's always a tragic mistake because Rome had a firm grip at this time. So, the Jews stage this revolt. Vespasian sends in his nephew, General Titus Florus. Titus Florus surrounds Jerusalem and starves the city. Josephus, who's the Jewish historian of, who worked for the Romans, said that the people were so hungry they resorted to cannibalism and you could smell the roasted human flesh in the air. If you tried escaping, you were crucified and a ring of crucified bodies surrounded Jerusalem. When the Jews finally surrendered, Titus Florus went in, and he just leveled the city. And that's where the temple was finally destroyed for the last time. And all that's left is that wailing wall that we see on the news. That's it, and that's why the Jewish people wail there. They're waiting for the rebuilding of the temple. But that's all that's left. And if you go to Rome, there is an arch, a monumental arch to Titus Florus. It actually shows the Roman soldiers carrying out the menorah and the sacred things from the temple as they looted. So, 70 AD. The reason why I mention that is because it's a pivotal point. The Jews realize we have got to do something to survive because our temple's gone. And that's when Judaism turns to a very strict Pharisaical Judaism 
and there's an official excommunication of anyone who believes in Christ. So until that time, like St. Paul would go to synagogues to preach, the Romans thought of the Christians to some extent as like a little subsect of Judaism and so on. But in the year 70, boom, formal excommunication. What it means for the church is they realize we too have to regroup and we need to write everything down. And that's why many of the scholars think that probably the Gospels beginning about this time were written. Now, the interesting thing is that the older scholarship going back to the early saints and even newer scholarship using the Dead Sea Scrolls would think that by the year 50 all the Gospels are written. So there's a little bit of flux in the dating. Now the only thing to really remember is to all of this that you do have again this oral period of teaching by our Lord. There's some point when the apostles are orally teaching but then there's also the writing. So what you need to realize is there's a work here. There's the Word of God which is written, but there's also the sacred tradition, the teaching, how it's lived, how it's been handed on. They work together. So the duty of the church has been to preserve and to understand what our Lord taught, what he revealed. So this New Testament period then eventually produces the 27 books of our New Testament. These books, I mentioned that Matthew, in its simplest form, was written in Aramaic Hebrew, but then was translated into Greek. These are all translated into Greek. And so, here again, you have Greek. Now, this is what we have as far as the structure. What you need to remember is very complicated. Changes in languages, changes in just the expressions that people use, but the interaction of the written word of God and what has been continually taught by the church. It's very dynamic. So really, when we look at this, we see a beautiful compilation of inspired literature, but it's God's word, over a course of salvation history. God guiding his people in the Old Testament bringing then this to a fulfillment in Christ, and now the mission of the church. And it goes on. Good. Any questions about this? Yes, I've got Frank. a certain amount of, I guess, curiosity there just before Christ was born with the, the, book, the wisdom books. Yes, the wisdom books. All of a sudden they seem to have all this knowledge about what happens when we die and, and all of that. Did they seem to have that figured out? Well, I'm, as far as the knowledge and why they now have this wisdom, I think it's simply because the situation of where Israel is at the time, they're no longer nomads, which would be like this period here. They're no longer dealing with wars from the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and so on. They're a conquered people, so really, once you get into the Greeks, so that's 333. Things have settled down. And maybe part of it is the influence of Greek philosophy too. That the Greek philosophers were talking about those things. So the Jews did too. Not that they didn't talk about them before, but now they're writing things down. And again, it's a settled period of time. Well, the Greek philosophers did all this thinking about why, why things are and why the are. Exactly. Are. So this is feeding into the, into the Jewish... Well, it may have motivated the Jewish people to answer those same questions. Again, not that they didn't talk about those things before, but that's what the wisdom literature focuses on. Okay. Now, next step. How do we get this together in one book? So given this timeline, who says we have a Bible here? Right? So, next sheet. If you look at the establishing of the canon of sacred scripture. 
Now, canon means read. It refers to a norm or a rule. So when we talk about the canon of sacred scripture, we're talking about those books that have been designated as the word of God. So 46 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New. Now, as far as the Old Testament, just a couple of little things. I've pretty much mentioned the fact that by the year 150, we have our last writings of the Old Testament. And the Jews had these writings in scrolls. So even if you went to, let's say, the synagogue today for the Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah services or just regular old synagogue services, the rabbi goes to the, they call it the Ark, and brings out the scroll of the Torah. And they're the first five books. Or he'll bring out the scroll of the prophets, and so on. And he reads from it. So these things circulated in scrolls. Now, there is the Septuagint. And the Septuagint was the Old Testament books translated into Greek. And this happened about the year 150 to 100 BC. So, but the point here is that by that time, the 46 books of the Old Testament were set. The Jewish people accepted them. So they were in scrolls, but then because of the Greek language becoming the cultured language, these books were translated into Greek. Now, Jews today would still read in Hebrew, right? but still for because of the cultural situation and wanting to, I guess, appeal to the masses, they were translated into Greek. Now, the New Testament. So we do have a New Testament translation in, into Latin. But these books, the 27 books like the Gospels, the Epistles of St. Paul, they too were circulating in scrolls. When we have our lesson on the history of the early church. There's actually a fragment that talks about that. Fragment meaning there's an archaeological fragment. It's called the Muratorian fragment that talks about the different scrolls that were used for the celebration of Mass, what writings were accepted. That's really these 27 books. Now, in the year 350, Saint Athanasius, great saint, great defender of the faith, Set, formally set the canon of sacred scripture. Not that it was really up for debate. I just mentioned that there was already a prescribed listing of what could be read at Mass, what was appropriate, the 27 books, but St. Athanasius says, this is it. He lists them. This is important. Now, one dating point here. The church was under persecution by the Roman Empire in the year th until the year 313. In 312, Constantine became the emperor. And Constantine legalized Christianity. He did not make it the state religion, no, but he did legalize it. So the church could come above ground. And church leaders could meet. So the Holy Father could meet with other bishops and so on freely. Churches could be built. So at this time, because the church has more freedom, then there's more of a movement to put everything together into a book, one big book. So, 350, St. Athanasius says, this is the official set canon of sacred scripture. He really didn't come up into something new here, but rather he was just <coughs> emphasizing what is. And he said, quote, these are the sources of salvation for the thirsty may drink deeply of the words to be found here. In these alone is the doctrine of piety recorded. Let no one add to them or take anything away from them. In 382, Pope St. Damasus asked St. Jerome to translate the 46 books of the Old Testament and the 27 of the New into Latin. The reason why is because... That's the common language. People who are cultured still speak Greek, but the church wanted the normal person to be able to 
have the Latin and for that to be read at Mass. St. Jerome was one of the few individuals at the time who was fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So Pope St. Damasus commissioned him to do the translation and he produced what is called the Vulgate. And the Vulgate version has continued to be revised in the sense of better clarity in translation, but it's still the term for the official Latin text of our Bible. Now, 393, Council of Hippo, Third Council of Carthage, accept this canon of sacred scripture, Pope Innocent does, and these are just little points to emphasize that the church accepted this canon, what we have here today. So from the very earliest times of our church, we accepted the Jewish scriptures, the 46 books, and then the 27 books we call our New Testament. Now, there was a need for an English translation. In 1382, Wycliffe produced the first English Bible translation, but he was condemned because it was a bad translation, too literal and too archaic. Now, once I was watching something and Jerry Falwell, God rest his soul, was, was promoting a Bible series, and he said, and the Catholic Church burned Wycliffe at the stake for translating the Bible into English. I said, no, he did a bad job of it. That's why we burned him at the stake. <laughs> so, so it wasn't as though he, because he translated, he just didn't do a good job. Now, 1441, Council of Florence. So this is a church council, meaning a meeting of all the bishops in union with the Holy Father. This is before the Protestant Reformation. It's also important because even though the Orthodox churches have separated, they're present, and for a brief time they reunite. So all the churches, so Catholic Church, Orthodox churches, once again affirm that these 73 books make up the Bible. Now, 1534, Luther translated the Bible into German. There are already 14 others, but Luther had a good point. He wanted a German language Bible for the people, so that's good. The problem is he eliminated seven books of the Old Testament. That's why if you have a Protestant Bible, you won't have 46 Old Testament books you'll have just 39, because Luther chucked seven of them. Now, some Protestant Bibles will have what are called apocryphas in them. So it says like King James Version with apocrypha refers to the seven books. So these seven books are mostly from the wisdom literature. It's First and Second Maccabees, which would be the two last historical books written in Greek, which would be about this time period between three hundred and one fifty. Then Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, Tobit, Judith. I think that's it, right? Is that seven? Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, Tobit, Judith. Yes, so that's seven, good. Now, why did Luther take out seven books of the Old Testament? Because he said, first of all, that they were the last written. Well, that's partially true. They were the last written. But they had been accepted, right? The Jews accepted them, and since the early church, we had accepted them. The real reason is because they disagreed with his theology. If you look at the Book of Wisdom, you find the passages about the purification of the soul. Interesting. And Luther denied purgatory. So we'll get into that. But he removed those seven books of the Old Testament. Now, he took the New Testament and he categorized it into what he called God's works of salvation, which is really the books he based his theology on, then other canonical books that he liked, and non-canonical, meaning Hebrews, James, Jude, Revelation, and then the seven Old Testament, he thought didn't belong there. Now, he wanted to remove Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation, but he didn't. Because the German princes said, we don't care if you fool with the Old Testament, because that deals with the Jews. But if you touch the New Testament, we aren't going to support you. So, Martin Luther 
didn't touch the Old Testament. But, you notice, he played some games. Like Martin Luther made 3,000 mistranslations. But he also would add little things. Like that whole idea of faith alone. There's no word alone in St. Paul's letter. It's by faith you're saved. Not faith alone. Whereas St. James, that Luther didn't like, St. James says it's not only faith you have to put it into action with works. They work together. It's not just works, but it's not just faith. Faith and works go together. If you have faith, you put it into action. And if you have good actions, you better have faith. So it works together. Luther didn't like that. Luther didn't like Hebrews because it talks about a sacrificial priesthood. And he denied that in the Mass. So, just a little thing here. So, 1563, Church of England. By now you have Henry VIII have split with the Catholic Church. And they talked about the deuterocanonical books, meaning those seven books that were cast out, the seven books of the Old Testament, were for example of life and instruction of manners, though they ought not to be employed to establish any doctrine. Well, 1545, the Council of Trent established again, once and for all, never to be dealt with again, that the canon of sacred scripture is 46 books of the Old Testament, 27 of the New. But they also saw the need to produce modern language translations. So for the Catholic Church, the first English translation after the Council of Trent was the Douay Reims Bible, really just named after the two cities where it was translated. But that was produced 1609-1610. For the Protestant churches, King James I, head of the Church of England, ordered an English translation. But he used Luther and Wycliffe, well, as scholars did. He really didn't do it. And there were 2,600 errors in translation. So time goes on. 1943, Pius XII, great pope, issued Divino Afflante Spiritu. And he told the scholars to go back. So go back to the original texts. So the original Hebrew Aramaic, original Greek, and do a good translation into modern languages. And that's really what produced eventually the New American Bible, which was done at Catholic University, the Revised Standard Version Bible, which was Catholic and Protestant scholarship, the New Jerusalem Bible, which was done in France, good translations of the Bible. So, and that's why it's very important because it's hard. The language is very difficult and you want to be able to express it. So, with that then, given how all of this has occurred, one thing to remember is how did we get the book? It was an action of the church. Keep that in mind. You know, when you think about it, it was, at some point, the church, the apostolic leadership saying, these are the books we accept as revelation, the word of God. This is what's going to be read at Mass. And it's the church that says, this is it. These 46, these 27. That's too part of the idea of the teaching of the faith. So when you think about, you know, it always sort of makes me itch when individuals, especially like fundamentalists, think Catholics know nothing about the Bible. Who do you think wrote the New Testament? You know, or who put it together? The Catholic Church did, right? So you can always tell them that. So, anyway, very important. But it was an act of the church that put everything together and said, this is it, not to be tampered with. Now, when you look then at the canon of sacred scripture here, So we have the Old Testament, which tells the story from creation going all the way up to about 150 BC, during that time of the Greek occupation of the Holy Land. They have categorized the books into really four sections. The first being the Pentateuch, 
which is just the first five books. Again, what the Jewish people call the Torah. Penta, of course, is that prefix meaning five, so it's the first five books. So for the Jewish people, you hear about the stories of Genesis, Abraham, and so on, the Exodus account, but also especially in the book of like Leviticus, then also in Deuteronomy. You hear about their different feast days, their kosher dietary laws. So if you're a good Orthodox Jew, you really follow the prescriptions of the Pentateuch, the Torah. And then come the historical books, and that's exactly what they are. They're relating the history of the Jewish people. People like the books of Ubi Gapu that goes on and on and on. To... Well, it has some of the who begat who, but also like the list of the different kings, the different invasions. So if you want to find out about the, let's say, the Assyrian invasion and the wicked kings like King Ahab and so on, Jezebel, that story, David and Bathsheba and so on, it's all there. Okay, So it goes through, and notice again, it ends up with first and second Maccabees, and that is because that's the period about 150 B.C. Now, next section, we have our wisdom books, mentioned that, and they're called the wisdom books because they deal with the wisdom, so the meanings of life, and so on. And then we have a set of the prophets. In this, we have four major prophets and 12 minor. Now, that has nothing to do with music. It has really to do with the length of their writings. So you didn't get that joke. So Isaiah, <laughs> Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel are the four major prophets. And if you look at their writings, like Isaiah, probably about 60 pages of the Bible, whereas something like little Amos is five. So the difference between major and minor. Now, you'll notice Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, and Baruch was a student of Jeremiah. So usually those three are all linked to Jeremiah. So that's why you have four major prophets, and that's why there's that order, and then you have the 12 minor ones. Okay? The... <sighs> The titles that are in the quotation marks are either the Latin traditional titles or they're, apparently they've changed some of the, the titles along the way, like where you see 1st and 2nd Samuel, it says 1st and 2nd Kings, and you have 3 Kings, 4 Kings, I don't, that's before my time, I don't know why they changed it, but this is what we have today, so that's okay. So, now if you go to the New Testament. So Old Testament, 46 books, New Testament 27, first section of the New Testament is the Gospels. So we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Again, Matthew is put first because Matthew is believed to be the first one written, at least in its simplest Hebrew Aramaic form. Now, each of the four Gospels has its own special qualities, but... Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Okay, so Matthew, Mark, Luke are called the synoptic because they give like a synopsis of Jesus' life. And if you put them parallel, they pretty much would follow the same story. Now, one caution here. Mark says nothing about Christmas or the early childhood of Jesus at all. He starts with the baptism of Christ and John the Baptist and so on and moves on through the resurrection. And the reason why is Mark didn't think it was important to mention the first part. Who knows? So each gospel is a little bit different because each of the gospel writers is writing for a particular audience and wants to include particular points or emphasize them. For instance, Matthew. We know Matthew was an apostle. Matthew was a very intellectual fellow because he was an accountant for one reason, tax collector 
didn't get that joke either. So, and being a tax collector for Rome, because I was an accountant, so being a tax collector for Rome, he had to know different languages. But Matthew wants to appeal to the Jewish audience. And that's why if you read his gospel, he's always putting these little phrases. This happened to fulfill what the prophet so-and-so said. Because he wants to show the Jewish people Christ is the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior. Now Luke was not an apostle. Luke was a disciple of St. Paul. Luke lived in an area where he would have known our Blessed Mother, too. Luke was a Greek physician, albeit a Jewish physician. Again, very complicated Greek writing. As far as style goes, Luke's the most complicated. Drove you crazy in the seminary trying to translate things. But Luke has a different perspective. And he talks about the mercy of God. This is where you have the parables of like the prodigal son that's included. And it's very much appealing to a Gentile audience that they're included too. And then you have Mark, who again was not an apostle, but a secretary to St. Peter. So actually, it's probably St. Peter dictating a lot of Mark's gospel. And so Mark writes that down. And it's really just, again, that major part of from the beginning of Jesus' public ministry to Easter. And then you have John. As I mentioned, John lives the longest. And John probably knew what Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote. John lived in Ephesus with the Blessed Mother. He took care of her till her time to go back to our Lord. And so John knew Luke. He probably saw these other Gospels and thought, well, I don't have to repeat this. So John includes all these long discourses, like the discourse between Jesus and the woman at the well, or Jesus and Nicodemus, Jesus' teaching about the Good Shepherd or the Bread of Life discourse. So John's different. So you have the four, or the three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and you have John. Now, why four? Again, each one has its own special qualities, and you have to look at all four to get the story of Christ. So what you ought to do is really start reading a gospel, and maybe take Mark, because it's the shortest, and go with that. Or maybe take Matthew, because it's the first, and go with that. Just read maybe a chapter each night, or even part of a chapter, and pray about it. Just think of the story, and think about how it applies to your life. Because we call it the Word of God, it's a living word. It's not something static, it's not like just literature, like Shakespeare. It's a living word. God continues to speak to us through this living word. Well, beyond the Gospels then, we also have Acts of the Apostles, which is the little history book. So beginning with the Ascension, going all the way through Pentecost, the journeys of St. Paul, St. Peter, early church. Yes, ma'am. Were each of the four Gospels actually written by the Apostles, or were some of them written by like disciples of the apostles. Okay, so were the gospels actually written by the apostles or by disciples? There are some today, some of these scripture scholars that would say it could have been a student, like St. Matthew's student or something. That's possible. Matthew may have dictated it and then the student wrote it down. But if you look at good old guys like St. Jerome and St. Augustine, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John actually wrote these things. So, and that's why, if, when you look at the current research, especially in light of what's been done with the Dead Sea Scrolls, they date it really by 50 before Gospels have been written and are circulating. And St. Paul actually attests to that because he talks about the Gospels. Why would St. Paul be talking about the Gospels if they didn't exist? Right? Now, one thing that I should have mentioned is the word Gospel means good news. Now that sounds sort of funny, you know, good news, right? But the word gospel itself was actually applied to messages that the emperor sent out to the whole empire. So it was a message for everyone, everyone who was a citizen of Rome. It was called a gospel. Well, 
we use the term gospel, this idea of good news, to show this is the message of Christ to us. See? So it's really God's revelation to us. So that's why we call it the good news. Now, the other thing is the importance of the gospel is always the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. What is called the kerygma. Kerig, kerygma. K-E-R-Y-G-M-A. Kerygma. And the point of any gospel is to profess that Jesus is the Lord and Savior who suffered, died, and rose for our salvation. And that's why Mark might not have the Christmas story. To him, that's not important. What's important is he's the Lord and Savior who suffered, died, and rose for our salvation. As I mentioned, Acts is the little first history book of the church. And then we have a series of epistles, which are letters. So there are the letters of St. Paul. And then we have... St. James, St. Peter, St. John, St. Jude. So a set of letters. And these letters were written to explain the faith to church communities or to individuals. And then finally we have the book of Revelation, also called the Apocalypse, because it does deal with the end world times, but the Apocalypse, Book of Revelation is the most complicated book of them all because St. John has this vision. And to read the book of Revelation, you have to almost do like a little diagram as you're reading it because it's like happening at this earthly level but happening in heaven. It's happening now, but it's happening in the future. It's a very complicated book. And there's a lot of different symbols that are involved that really gets into a technical kind of scholarship. So, anyway, very complicated book. But the real point of Revelation is, be faithful. You don't know exactly when Christ is coming, but he's coming. And you better be ready. That's the point of the book of Revelation. So, all right. Any questions about this at all? I'm just Kevin. curious. Um, there's 46 Old Testament books come from uh, the Jewish people uh -huh. that were accepted. What, what are some examples of, of their writings which were not accepted and why? Are there, are there well, I don't, actually, I don't know of any writings of the Jewish people that weren't accepted. So I don't know. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't study that part. <laughs> I'll be very honest with you. I didn't study that. But I know in the New Testament times there was like an epistle of St. Barnabas and there's a story called the Shepherd of Hermas that was very popular, but they weren't accepted. Okay. Because they were not seen to be authentic. And that's actually bring up a good point, because what makes these four Gospels accepted? Because they had apostolic authorship, that they were true to the teachings of Christ and the church, and that they had been always accepted, we, meaning we knew where they came from. Whereas you hear now and then of these Gnostic Gospels, you know, with that whole Da Vinci Code thing, right? Gnostic. Boo. Gnostic Gospels. And if you, how many have read the Da Vinci Code? Admit it. So I did, don't worry. I had to know what I, everybody's talking about. But... Dan Brown does a very infantile scholarship on this. The Gnostics were a group of heretics that emerged probably about the year 150 AD. So you have to think, way past the time of the apostolic period, way past the writings of the New Testament, way past the time when all of this was being read at Mass. Okay? So the Gnostics appear about the year 150. And they were bizarro because they believed in a dual power. You had God and devil. Equal powers, first mistake. That's a heresy. God is God, devil's a creature. But for them, you had God, you had the devil. And God was all good, devil was all evil. God is spiritual, devil is material. 
everything spiritual is of God, everything material is of the devil. And somewhere along the line, poor man, souls fell from heaven. And we became imprisoned in these mean, evil things called bodies. So for the Gnostics, it took a special gnosis, knowledge, to release the soul from the body. So they had these different stories. And Jesus was just a spirit coming about. He wasn't really true God who became true man. He just appeared to be a man and so on. So the Gnostics, first of all, did not engage in procreation. Because why would you want to imprison another soul in a body? You wouldn't want to do that. So abortion was prevalent among the Gnostics. Or celibacy was prevalent for good Gnostics. But then at the same time, they thought, how do you get this like ecstasy of Gnosis? Have an orgy. That was Gnostics too. But for their highest act of religion, commit suicide. Because then you release the soul from the body. Screwy group, right? But they, to make their point and to infiltrate, penned what they called Gospels and used names like the Gospel of St. Thomas or St. James or even Judas of all things. Go figure that one. I canceled my subscription to National Geographic over that one and because they had some exhibit about the Gospel of Judas. And then the St. James, St. Thomas, and so on. But they were bogus and they were condemned by the church. For good reason. They're heretical. They had heretical stories in them. Not true to what the Lord had given to us. Not what had been taught by the church in this time period. And again, they weren't written by authentic apostolic people like St. Matthew, St. Mark, and so on. And they weren't true to the teachings. So, Gnostic Gospels. Boo, hiss. If you ever hear about them, heretical. And if anybody ever says, why the Catholic Church excludes the Gnostic Gospels? Because they're heretical. They aren't real Gospels. Did you ever hear that one? About the, I did when this whole Da Vinci Code thing was going on. You know, mean old Catholic Church, how could it not have these Gospels? Why did so on? They weren't really Gospels. They're heretical books. So, enough said about that. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Yes. Said for the scholars to go back to the original text. Yes. Can we go back to the St. Athanasius text or the St. Jerome text? Are they, are they they still exist? Is that what they they actually went to the original manuscripts, so pious as best that they could. As Pius XII wanted good new translations. So whatever the original texts they could find, going back to the earliest versions. Hmm? Yes. Or both. Yeah. So we have the original texts. I mean, we have the original Greek texts of the scriptures. I can show them if you want. I mean, I've got a book of. I'm just wondering, you know, going back to the thing you mentioned about Luther, Martin Luther, that he said he used to understand Greek texts and alone. Right. added that word alone. That's such a sort of division or controversy now between Catholics and Protestants. But it shouldn't be. Isn't there a way of looking at those original texts? There is. It's either there or not. Or sure is. Is there a question about actually? No. You can go to my Greek Bible that I have, and you can see that. The Greek text says, you're saved by faith, not faith alone. And that's a problem with translation. Have you ever heard of the Good News Bible? That's a real wacky one. Right? It's like the cool jive language Bible. Well, where do they come up with it? Or like I mentioned last week, when the, the new revised standard version came out, they changed what Jesus said to the apostles, go out and I'll make you fishers of men, to go out and I'll make you fish for people. Big difference. The text says, the original Greek, go out, I will make you fishers of men. Not fish for people. Okay? Politics. Politics. But as back to Luther, this is one thing. 
you have Romans by St. Paul and you have St. James. You have to use both to get the message. Right? Okay, last question. Okay? Yes. Connie. Um, don't you think that uh, the fact that none of the gospel speaks of the destruction of the temple, which would have been a whole change in the world, testifies to it earlier in the 70s of all the gospels? Makes sense to me. <coughs> and that's one reason why St. Jerome and all those old guys, the good old church fathers, said that. But you got into this whole new scripture scholarship in the late 1800s, early 1900s that came up with this other idea. But we don't need to go into all that. Okay, I just present the case. All right, gang. We'll see you next week. We'll finish up sacred scripture next week and then move on to the hardest class, which is about the Trinity. All right? We'll see you then.